All right, welcome back to this uh, episode of the Comics Multiverse. My guest uh, today is Chris Weston, who is currently working with Zoop on a collection for Time Breakers, which is a series that he worked on with the late Rachel Pollack. Um, and if you can't caught my interview with uh, Jordan Flosky of Zoop the other night, he mentioned this, and but uh, he was able to set me up an interview with Chris. And uh, let's get to it. Let's find about, uh, more about Chris, his career, and the project. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> How's it going, Chris? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Thank, th thanks for getting in touch. Oh, not a problem. Always, uh, always interested to talk with creators and see, you know, what they're working on and help uh, help them, you know, get the word out about their the different projects they're working oh, I really on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So, before we get into um, talking about Time Breakers, uh, the collection, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your history with comics, both as a reader and as a professional. Oh, right. Um, well, I've, re I've read comics all my life. Um... Uh, when, I, when I was a kid, I was an, I was an army brat, and so uh, I lived in various military bases around Europe and Cyprus. Uh, I mean, this, this was back in the 70s. Uh, uh, so there was a good a few years of my childhood where I, I, I didn't um, have access to a TV because we lived abroad. And um, so comics were like, like my main form of uh, entertainment really and what was great is my dad really liked comics so we didn't I, di I didn't he didn't just like hand them to me and send me off to the bedroom to read um he'd read them as well and uh so and we talk about them all the time uh, in the same way that you talk about a, a tv program and we we talk about the cliffhangers and what we think was gonna happen next week so i've got my dad to thank really for uh getting me into comics um, uh, they were mainly um, British comics, sort of probably not titles that will mean much to you. Things like um, uh, Victor and Lion and Valiant and Hotspur, uh, and eventually uh, 2000 AD. I know uh, that one. Yes, yes. <laughs> Is that one the only one that's going? Yeah. There used to be hundreds of British comics. It was British comic industry was, was pretty big at one point. You know, I think they passed, I think, like the Eagle comic, possibly sold in millions, but it, they're slowly retracted over the years. Uh, so so much so that 2000 AD is like the last man standing. Um, uh, but th there was one particular comic called Vulcan, and, 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 and uh, until 2000 AD came along, Vulcan was my absolute favourite comic in it, because it had this comic strip in it called The Trigon Empire, which was a fully painted which featured fully painted artwork by uh, Don Lawrence. And then years later, by some bizarre cosmic coincidence, I, I found out Don Lawrence lived near me and, and, I, I, and I asked him if I could go and meet him and, uh, and occasionally watch him paint. And, you know, he was very, very generous with his time and allowed me to go, go and visit his studio and, I, and I'd sit in the corner and basically watch him work. Um, uh, and, and so he kind of fostered my interest and, um, you know, by this time I, I wanted to be a comic strip artist my, myself. And then at some point I, I had to choose between going to university or accepting his offer to be a, an apprentice for a year. Uh, and so I, I decided on that route instead. So I, th I didn't go to college or anything, but I did a year's apprenticeship with a, uh, this artist called Don Lawrence, who I don't know if you know his work, but Google it. It's, it's absolutely amazing. He's, he, he was famous for two strips, uh, the Trident Empire, as I said, and um, an, another strip called Storm. I mean, the, 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 these comics sold. They're not, I don't, I, I'm not entirely sure they've been printed in America, but they were like huge on the European continent, and so much so that. Uh, he got knighted in Holland, you know, for services to publishing. You know, he was a pretty big, pretty famous guy. So I couldn't have asked for, a, you know, a more fortunate or, you know, luckier start to my career, really. And then, and, you know, just kind of looking at uh, the stuff you've worked with besides Time Breakers, I mean, I, you've, you've worked on one of my favorite uh, 
books, uh, the filth, I mean. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, after, uh, my, after my year with Don Lawrence, so I then got work with 2000 AD, and then a couple of years after that, made the jump to US comics, and in particular, Vertigo, you know, where I did like Lucifer and the Invisibles and the Filth. You know, that's one of my creator own books with with Grant Morrison. Yeah. Oh, I, it's it's one of the books where like I I think my my brother gave me a bunch of comics and that run was in there and I started reading it. It's just like I the you know halfway through the the series I needed a, a stiff drink to kind of keep up with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was quite interesting because uh, I think it, it it sort of came just after the creative divorce that Mark Miller and Grant Morrison had, and it, it was interesting to see which two, which like opposite directions they both travelled off in. Like uh, mm -hmm. Mark went on to do the Authority, which was a really sort of commercial and you know mainstream book, and Grant did the filth, which is <laughs> the complete opposite. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, your work with Timebreakers. I know you worked with the uh, late Rachel Pollock, who you know did a lot of fantastic Doom Patrol stories. But uh, tell us a little bit more about you know kind of the basis of you know what you know, time break time, time breakers and kind of working with her. Oh well, yeah, it, it's it. it it's going to sound boring, but there's not there's not much to report on that front, really. Um, it was uh, Stuart Moore who got in touch with me. He'd he he'd been the editor who'd scooped me up from 2000 AD and brought me to US Comics. Uh, I think he was the editor of my first American comic, which was um, Swamp Thing 153. Um, and then I did some Invisibles with him. Uh, and then he got the job to set up a new imprint at DC Comics called Helix, and it was going to be—it's going to try and it, it was designed to reproduce the success of Vertigo, but with a series of comics that were um, uh, science fiction themed, which is right up my alley. I mean, I, I didn't—it's I, I, it's one of the reasons I wanted to get into comics because I love science fiction so much. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm more drawn towards science fiction stories and I am toward, uh, towards superhero stories, probably because of my upbringing with 2000 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so um, it, it, he had a, it was, it was all happened quite quickly and quite smoothly really. He just said, oh, I've got a five, part, a five issue book written by Rachel Pollock. I think it was all pretty much written. Uh, I don't remember waiting around for script at any point. Uh, I don't, don't, don't remember any delays or thing. I might have even have got them all in one go. Uh, it was just a case of, I think I had one chat on the phone to Ray George and that was just to introduce myself and say hi. But beyond that, it was pretty smooth sailing really. Just got the scripts uh, cracked on and drawn. There's, there's very little behind the scenes drama <laughs> or, or <laughs> anecdotes for me to relate really. Um, what can I say? I'm trying, trying to think of anything uh, that makes a good anecdote about its creation, but uh, it was pretty much smooth sailing, really. Well, tell us a little bit about Time Breakers, um, the premise of it, the you know the characters, and whatever you want to, you know. Yeah, well, it, um, know. It's, it's the premise that hooked me because uh, she came up with a killer idea. Mm -hmm. um, it, she kind of subverted. Uh, the, the, the formula of time travel stories, because uh, normally in time travel stories, it's the villain who wants to change the direction of history. And um, sort of like you've got the Terminator who wants to prevent the birth of um, John Connor or Biff Tannen, making sure that he gets the almanac. Uh, it's, it's either the villain or some sort of uh, ignorant person who accidentally changes history, like in uh, Ray Bradbury's A Sound of Thunder, stepping on the butterfly with dire consequences. So normally in, in fiction, uh, changing the historical flow of time is something to be avoided at 
all, at all cost, and it's usually the domain of uh, you know evil or stupid people. Uh, but the, the the premise with Time Break is is what if it's the heroes that are actually deliberately setting out to meddle and change the time stream, and and it's actually the bad guys who've just got this uh, like pure idea of a single timeline who are trying to stop them. And I, I think it's an idea we've since seen in uh loki uh you know where the 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 bad guys or uh organization have a very sort of zealous and fundamental view that there is one perceived idea of historical events and it must be preserved at all cost and it's our heroes who are sort of interfering with things and changing the flow of time uh, yeah, I, th I thought that was a pretty cool premise. Uh, the, char the characters are um, the, the, the actual time breakers themselves are uh, are, are rec re recruited uh, from historical time. So you, you've got a like a, a Greek warrior, and well, our lead characters are like a bored fifties housewife. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got a um, uh, Somalian warrior, uh, all kinds of different people, uh, and the the one of the weird ideas is uh, they're always recruited by a future version of themselves. So uh, it's the whole idea of uh, meddling with time and creating as many paradoxes as possible, which leads up to like the biggest paradox of all, which I, I won't spoil. Okay. Pretty much, really. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you were, were working on the originally working on the series, was there what, like a certain character that you kind of got became attached to, or you know, enjoyed enjoyed it, you know drawing yeah. more than others? Well, it, it, I think it was a big challenge for me because, uh, as I said, the lead characters are female. Uh, I'm. I have to admit that drawing women uh, wasn't and probably still isn't my my strong point. Um, it's, but but there's nothing better than pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and uh, doing st things that maybe don't play to your strengths, but force you to get better at something. It's, it's always a, a, having a, a steep learning curve is always a, a cool thing. I think. Uh, Challenging yourself like that, so yeah, that I think uh, that that was that was an aspect that was simultaneously challenging, but also beneficial to me. Really, I think at the time, um, originally, uh, I, I made her look a little bit too much like um, Modesty Blaze, which I was really into at the time, uh, particularly when Modesty Blaze was drawn by this artist called Jim Holdaway, and. Uh, I thought, oh, this this can be my tribute to Jim Holdaway, and so I made the lead character look like uh, Modesty Blaze quite a lot. And Stuart, when I sent in the artwork for the first episode, that was one of the first things Stuart picked up on. I go, Chris, you've just drawn Modesty Blaze. We can't get away with this. So I had to go through the entire first episode. And this is before Photoshop, I had to go through the entire first episode and fix her face and her hairdo <laughs> and uh, literally c cut it out, you know, little heads with scalpels and glue them onto, back onto the artwork. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, th I think we got away with it. She ended up looking like um, uh, Audrey Hepburn instead of Modesty Blaze because uh, mm -hmm. I really liked the... Uh, you know the the actress at the time, uh, and I didn't I didn't want to draw. Um, uh, I I mean I mean this was in the nineties, which was sort of known for image comics, which were like big and brash, and the women were all quite tall and Amazonian and large breasted. So I, I wanted to do something a bit different and uh, have a slim, uh, small breasted woman as a lead character. <laughs> Now you said that uh, Rachel, when she, when you came on, she had already written it. Um, and you, it sounds like you also had some input into some of the character designs. Is, is that 
Yeah, pretty am much. I, am, pretty I, am I making that connection? Yeah, yeah, I've pretty much left to my own devices, really. Um, uh, it, was, it was difficult in those days, again, because it was before everyone had a home computer. Uh, so if you were going to send illustrations, they'd have to come through on a, on facts. So I might I might have sent some uh, facts illustrations. Uh, I certainly can't find them if I had. Um, I, I, I think possibly not. I think I was just allowed to just crack on and uh, go for it, uh, just dive in at the deep end. Yeah, as I say, I mean, if I'd have... One reason I suspect I, I suspect I probably didn't do any character designs is because um, we wouldn't have had that uh, situation where I'd drawn someone looking too much like Modesty Blaze if I'd <laughs> worked it out beforehand. So let's talk about the uh, campaign that's currently running on Zoop. It looks like there's about nine days left. Um, as of right now, you're over the... Hooray! Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm pretty surprised at that. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, you know, pleasantly surprised. Uh, I'm quite delighted about it. Uh, I, I had a sneaky feeling it, it might not uh, reach it because the material is so old and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, it wasn't a big seller in its day. Um, so I, I didn't know if there would be the demand for it. But it's also never been, it's never been reprinted or collected in Ovec. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do it, just to fill that hole. I always thought it would work better as a single story rather than a serialized comic, mainly because of the nature of the uh, the time loops in it where certain events are repeated or seen from different angles. And it's easier for, a, if, if, if a story is all in one book, it's easier to for a reader to refer back and go, oh, yeah, so, so we're riffing off that sequence that happened before. Uh, to just sort of work better as a single book. So uh, it basically it's like an absolute, it's an absolute collection that you're working on putting together. Uh, yeah, um, ab absolute. You know, not to use. You know that. I mean, I, I, it's it's not. It's it. It is a. It's pretty. It's the same comic as was released. It's it's it, um, when the rights rever reverted back to uh, Rachel and I. We we got all the art folders, so um, it, it 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 would look exactly like the original book. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I had hoped to. I, mean, I, I, I would have ideally. I, I'd have liked to recolor it, but just uh, I, di I just didn't think it was financially possible. Really, uh, I, I think if we'd have added the price of a of new colors on it, um, uh, we probably wouldn't have reached our target. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the colors are fine. You know, it, it was really early days for computer colors. But so while I had some. Uh, question marks about it. I showed it to jo Jordan at uh, Zoom. He's like, Chris, we going to do this? That's great. It's fine. So it's just me being <laughs> a, a, a little bit of a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's exactly the same book as, as came out in the 90s. Um, I've added some... I still have every single uh, page of original art from it. So uh, that, that, ideally, I'd, I'd like to have out a black and white version but uh um it, it makes more financial se se uh, sense to put out a color version i think uh, color books sell better than black and white books but uh, <laughs> if it, 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 if it get, the great thing about it is uh if if it sparks interest and people want to see like um what you know sort of iew style artist edition I, I, i've still got all the artwork so that's something we could mm -hmm. possibly do at a later date but as it is, we we I've um, there will be a gallery section where you, we, we, we that will present you know some of these new the newly scanned artwork in the in the back, so people can have a look at it, you know, see the best pages at least in a much more pristine condition. Yeah. I know you mentioned you know the coloring. Is there anything else that you know you've had time to as it's sat for a little bit? And now you're looking at it again. Do you? And I'm sure as an artist, you kind of pick out things that maybe you could have, you know, wanted to improve or kind of, uh, I don't know. I, 
I may, I may actually, I mean, a lot of my early work makes me uh, cringe with despair. Uh, but I, I, I've got to say, um, the time breakers isn't something I'm too embarrassed about, uh, really. I think it holds up quite well. Um, I think I'm pretty, um, I think there's a couple of pages I could have inked better. Uh, but I think the storytelling's, you know, solid. Uh, I think my uh, illustration style is, is, you know, holds up well. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, I, no, there's not much I'd change really. I, I wouldn't. Don't think it needs like a George Lucas special edition. I mean, I, uh, I'm not. I'm not being big-headed here because there. Like, trust me, if uh, I, I am my own worst critic, I would happily rant for hours about how awful some of my early artwork is. But no, I'm. I, I'm uh, uh, I, you know, I had a good editor in Stuart, so if it was anything. You know, egregiously bad or badly drawn. That he, he would uh, suggest a change or pick it out. You know, before we went to press. Okay. And what was the was there a reason why you chose to go with Zoop as the platform for crowdfunding as opposed to trying to do? I mean, Kickstarter or something. Else? I'm just I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Um... I was recommended them by. Um, uh, I've been approached by uh, another comic book company about reprinting Time Breakers, and I was, I was quite keen on what they're suggesting until I looked closely at their contract. It did mean signing over like the you know media rights to them for a certain period, which meant that. You know, while it'd be nice to for them to do all the hard work of publishing the book and distributing it, if it suddenly got attention from a film company and they wanted to make a film of it, uh, they they uh, this comic book company would then own fifty percent of it. And I thought, no, I don't want to do this. Is a book that it's drawn. Is it? I, you know, Rachel and I have already put the hard work in on this. Uh, we're not just going to give away 50% of it just for the sake of a reprint. And But then someone said to me, well, what about Zoop? And I hadn't heard of them. And uh, and, and I looked into it and, got, and they, they sort of fixed up a, um, you know, a, an email introduction to, to me and Jordan. And... Um, and we took it from there. Really, it took, took me a long time to be persuaded. I was, I was, I was uh, mainly because I was one of the artists that got uh, suckered into doing a charity book. Um, that was a, a Kickstarter thing uh, I, that never came out. And yeah, I don't know. I donated a page of free art and. I think. Do you know the project I'm referring to? Not right um, offhand. Don't, 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 don't. For potentially legal reasons, but that basically, I'd been I'd been involved in a Kickstarter thing that that to this day, the people that put, put their money into it didn't get their still haven't received their books. So I, that that kind of soured me on um, Kickstarter projects. Uh, not Kickstarter, crowdfunding. Uh, if, if I've said Kickstarter before, what I mean is crowdfunding. Crowdfunding, it's just, yes. It's just, I got used to saying Kickstarter uh, because it's it was like one of the first crowdfunding um, platforms out there. Anyway, that, 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 that my involvement in this charity book that didn't end up being very charitable kind of soured me on crowdfunding projects, but um, it was left to Jordan to slowly... Uh, you know, coax me out of my defensive position and assure me that um, Chris is fine. We, we this is what we do for a living. You know, we don't we, we don't want to to muck this up either. You know, you yeah. Know, we we we'll, you know it's our reputation as well. So, um, and also I was really busy, and I I'm not a great multitasker. I, I, I and I was in the middle of another comic strip, and I kept putting him off, going, yeah, yeah. I'll come back to it, and eventually I finished that other comic strip, and I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll give Timebreakers some attention, and uh, got back with 
you know, in touch with Jordan, and uh, and it was Goa. The, the sad part is during that time, uh, Rachel unfortunately passed away, and she'd given me her blessing to continue with it before she went. And uh, her surviving partner will receive fifty percent of the profits of the book. You know, as yeah, as the rights have reverted to her, but also because it's it's a decent thing to do. Definitely. Um, so besides the comic books, it looks like you've done some other, uh, you know, concept art and even some uh, costume design. Oh, yeah. yeah, I will. <laughs> the, 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 obviously, the big one was uh, working on uh, costumes for the Flash movie in particular, uh, w working on Michael Keaton's Bat costumes and well, I can't take full credit for, you know, what you eventually see on, on the film. There's definitely a, a percentage of my DNA in there uh, somewhere. <laughs> but um, but in particular, one of the costumes that you see in the Batcave, like on a stand, uh, it, it is the one I'm particularly proud of. Uh, so, yeah, yeah that, that, that was really exciting. That was during the lockdown. Uh, so, unfortunately, I didn't get to visit the studio, and it was all done in... Ooh, in the, in this room, uh, <laughs> but I tell you, when I got that call, going, you know, oh, we'd like you to work on the Flash, and uh, you know, help design the bat suits. And I was like, yes, Batman! <laughs> oh, Michael Keaton is my Batman. As soon as I put the phone down, I was I was doing the bat dance around the studio. Like, wow, so exciting! Uh, and, and I remember when they said that when they phoned me up and said we want you to work on the bat suit. The first thing I blurted out is, I want to bring back the yellow oval. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, yeah, Chris, yes, don't worry. We're bringing back the yellow oval. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we want. I said, yes, fantastic. <laughs> well, do you have time for uh, to do a second segment I like to call five questions? Yeah, sure, of course. Okay. Uh, first question: uh, If you could go back and create a paradox any any time any in any uh, oh. space and time, where would it be? <laughs> oh, oh, God! <laughs> I feel, I feel, oh. uh, you you you, you caught me unexpected. Let me have a think. What what would uh, what paradox? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll try and think of a. Uh, uh, personal one. Um, let me have a think. I think uh, I would avoid. I would. I would tell my younger self to not play in my uh, young, uh, in my local field, just wearing shorts, because I, I have had. I have. I seem to suffer from tick bites quite badly. And I have a very bad reaction. So if I can avoid uh, getting tick bites, uh, and I mean, I've, I've had like Lyme's disease in, in the past. So oh. I, I think uh, some sort of alternative timeline where I didn't get Lyme, Lyme's disease would be good. <laughs> hey, I can't, I can't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, question number two. You've uh, worked on um, you've again with along with your work with um, on the Helix line and Vertigo. You've also done some Starman, JSA stuff like that. Is it and some of a few things with Marvel? Is there is there a certain character that, if given the chance from either one of those companies, oh, that you would like to do? Yeah, I mean. At Marvel, um, Doctor Strange would be right up my street. Something really psychedelic and uh, mad. I, I've always liked Doctor Strange. In fact, what, um, uh, there's a there's a, an, an issue of Marvel fanfare that's got a, a short do, uh, Doctor Strange story by Dave Gibbons, which he did in fully painted color, uh, which is not something it, it does very often. It's like one of my favorite comics, and uh, it's, it and it's, it's a comic I reach for on many occasions to look at uh, and uh, so do something in a similar style to that would be great. Uh, uh, what about DC? Well, Superman, uh, I still think I've got uh, 
a, a good Superman store in me, in me somewhere. Uh, I'm a big fan of Silver Age Superman, so uh, at, at some point I need to beg uh, DC to let me have uh, another go at Superman. I did, I did one with Rob Williams years ago. <laughs> it was only 10 pages long, but we crammed in everything we've ever wanted to do with Superman into 10 pages. <laughs> So every panel is, is is like a different story. It's basically a life, a day in the life of Superman where you see him doing lots of different things and every panel is something completely different, like fighting a giant Lex Luthor robot or stopping Bizarro from becoming a president and um, or de uh, defeating... Um, uh, Gorilla Grodd. Each panel is a completely self-contained story. So, but I, I, it's it, it's just made me hungry to do more. Really, I think. Okay. Um, question number three: uh, Who are your creative influences as an artist? Uh, well, obviously, number one is Don Lawrence, who was my mentor, uh, and he introduced me to the work of Mobius, um, who I just just think is astounding and um, possibly my favorite artist of all time. Um, and aside from that, I think it's, it's got to be Brian Bolland, really, because uh, uh, in particular, Brian Bolland's work on Judge Dredd uh, just blew my mind as a kid and uh, I absolutely worshipped it. So yeah, so I'll go with that. Don Lawrence, Mobius, and Brian Bolland. Okay, Pretty solid group. <laughs> yeah, I once saw. Um, <laughs> I once was when, obviously when I was Don's apprentice, I, I would accompany him to comic conventions, and there was one convention where I, you know, like had a ringside seat while Don was chatting to Mobius, and it's like, wow, my two comic gods, and I'm just like sitting here um listening to them bantering away and uh, they obviously had a good friendship because don was uh, don absolutely hated superheroes and he was sort of he was like pretending to scold mobius going why are you doing the super surfer comic well, you, don't, you don't need to do that <laughs> and, the, and mobius go oh, i'm sorry don i just wanted to have a go it's fine we have a laughing about it but <laughs> that's a quite a nice little memory and uh and eventually, when I, when there was a lull in the conversation, I got a chance to talk to Mobius. I, could, I couldn't think of anything to say except, um, "Oh, you having a nice stay in England, Mister Mobius?" And he's like, "Oh, yes, very nice, thank you." And that was it. I couldn't think of it. <laughs> it blew my chance to, you know, uh, see if I can get some artistic tips out of him or advice. <laughs> All right, uh, question number four. Um, if you had to pick five things to take with you uh, to a desert island for the rest of your life, what would they be? And I will include complete runs and, you know, full oh, series I of think, books. Desert Island comic books. Uh, yes. Okay. Ah, oh, I, I, I mean, I'm tempted to run over to my uh, bookcase and drag, drag a moment to you. Okay. I, I, I mean, I think uh, I think I'd go with the Cursed Earth, uh, which is a Judge Dredd graphic novel, um, which is mainly uh, I think it's a it's a, it's a complete story, but the art is shared by Brian Bolland and Mick McMahon, who I, I think are two are the two greatest Judge Dredd artists. So having both their work in one book, uh, it seems like a sensible thing to do. Uh, I've got to have a bit of Judge Dredd as well because I, I, I love that character. Uh, then I've got to have Don Lawrence book, obviously. So I, I'd have uh, um, I'd have my copy when I when I was a kid, and I was reading Don Lawrence's Trigon Empire in, in the Vulcan Weekly. Um, my dad removed, cut out all the uh, Trigon Empire pages, had them specially bound into a, a book. My, by my uncle. My uncle was a bookbinder for for the British Museum, so he knew how to preserve and mend old books. and And so they, they took all my Trigon Empire pages and put them in one big book. So that's a a, a prized possession. So I, that would have to go with me. 
I got have some Mobius, so I'd probably go for uh, the uh, the airtight garage. Uh, uh, it's just this bonkers psychedelic odyssey featuring his uh, character Major Gruber, and nearly every page is drawn in a completely different style, and it's uh, it, 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 it's it's amazing, mind blowing. Uh, where are we? So I've got Dread. I've got Mobius, I've got Don Lawrence. Oh, oh yeah, Dan Dare, I think, by Frank Hansen. Uh, a particular, if I had to nail down one book, I'd go with this book called The Man, the Man From Nowhere. It's a Dan Dare adventure. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was published by Dragon's Dream. Uh, and it collects this uh, story called the, the Man From Nowhere. Um, Dragon's Dream was actually uh, a pub uh, a book publishing company owned by Roger Dean, who used to do all the covers for Yes, uh, the rock band. And he was a big mm -hmm. uh, fan of Frank Hampson. So that'd be one. So I've got, uh, and that leaves one left. So, oh, well, I'll go for a, I'll go for a collection of Silver Age Curse One Superman, I think. Okay, nice. All right, and uh, question number five. Besides uh, avoiding tech fights, uh, what as it, if you could go back and tell a younger a, tongue, a, a younger you give your younger you some advice about being an artist, what what would it be? Oh, okay, uh, life drawing. Do life drawing every week. Go get get out your get out your studio or. Uh, sit in a cafe for an hour a week and just draw sketch people it's all about people i th i think um yeah and that's usually the advice when uh uh when when people come and show me their portfolios uh at, at conventions that's usually the advice i give people going you know i say like oh yeah i like your imagination i like your storytelling but you've got to improve the way you you draw people really and this is something that we all need to do it it's something you never I mean, unless you're an absolute you know genius uh, like neil adams or alan davis who are, have astonishing um anatomical anatomical knowledge uh, it's something we can all continually improve on i think really so but, yeah get out and do some life drawing Nice. All right. Uh, as we kind of wrap up here, um, if you want to give us one more pitch uh, for uh, Time Breakers, and uh, let it, or do you have anything else that you're work, currently working on that you can talk about? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, um, uh, aside from Time Breakers, uh, 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 Dark Horse announced this week that uh, my new creator-owned comic book is coming out in July, which is it's called Paranoid Gardens, and it was... Uh, Written by, co written between Gerard Way of uh, Umbrella Academy and My Chemical Romance fame, and his writing partner, Sean Simon. Uh, so that's quite exciting at the moment. Um, we're busy plugging that as well. And it, it makes, quite, makes, makes quite a nice companion piece to Time Breakers because uh, I think Gerard is a big fan of 90s Vertigo, Stroke Helix comics, and you can definitely feel the, the, the love for that era of comics in his own work, except he's, he's made it much more updated and uh, relevant to today's audiences. Uh, yeah, but both feature like a, a female character. See, I, I, despite saying earlier I'm, I'm not great at uh, drawing females, I've, I, I've, I've landed yet another comic strip that features a lead character, which is why you've got you to get out and do life drawing, because uh, it helps you with these challenges. Uh, yeah, so that's coming out in July. It's a, like a weird uh, tale. Uh, I think we decided that in the press release to bill it as like Derek, the Ricky Gervais series meets Doctor Who, because it's set in this weird, eerie, sort of rundown care home, uh, but, it's, but all the residents are very strange people. There's like, uh, superheroes 
is having psychotic episodes, there's aliens, there's ghosts, and also there's an element of the prison to it because you're not quite sure who's a resident and who's who's who works for the place, who the carer is. It, there might be a grey area in, in the middle. Uh, so I'd recommend people to rush out and buy that in July as well. Well, I'd love to have you back on around that time, and we'd love to talk about that uh, yeah, series and uh, chat more about that one and see how uh, your uh, you know the whole Time Breakers uh, campaign wrapped up. Oh, I'd love to come back. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Well, uh, are you on social media? Is there somewhere people oh, can yeah. find you? <laughs> I'm always on Twitter. I'm, I'm a bit of a or X as it's now known. I'm a bit of a, a, a Twitter addict, and it's just a it's just a stream of uh, talking about James Bond, the prisoner, <laughs> uh, and comics, really, and uh, bad jokes. Uh, it could be worse. Yeah, there's, I know. Worse, there, there, there's worse things on there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm usually blabbing about the uh, or, or Lee Marvin films. Uh, you, you, just you, just old stuff, basically. With the stuff that uh, I enjoy chatting about. I will definitely uh, check that out and uh, include those links in the show notes. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Oh, all right. Well, thank you for taking the time uh, to chat. And uh, I'm glad we were able, able to work out the uh, time difference between uh, across the pond, I guess. Yeah. No, <laughs> what, what, what's time now? It's, uh, it's nearly 7 o'clock. It's almost 3. Yeah, yeah. I've got a few more hours of work to do, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I will definitely hit you back up around uh, July so we can talk about the Dark Horse book. Excellent. You know, you said, what's it like working with Gerald? I said, oh, it's really boring, really. <laughs> <laughs> no exciting anecdotes. <laughs> I'll try, I'll try and, I'll try and uh, go out for a drink with him between now and then so I've got something scandalous to report. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Uh, again, best of luck as the uh, campaign wraps up in the next oh, week, and uh, yeah, yeah. Be, inter be interested to talk with you more in the future. So, brilliant. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. All right. Have Thank a good you. day. Thanks. Bye.